This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. What if comparing car insurance rates was as easy as putting on your favorite podcast? With Progressive, it is. Just visit the Progressive website to quote with all the coverages you want. You'll see Progressive's direct rate, and then their tool will provide options from other companies so you can compare. All you need to do is choose the rate and coverage you like. Quote today at Progressive.com to join the over 29 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Comparison rates not available in all states or situations. Prices vary based on how you buy. It's been almost 15 years since the release of the movie The Blind Side. The 2009 film was a box office hit. It was nominated for Best Picture at the Oscars, it won Best Actress, and it's based on the life of former NFL star Michael Orr, an inspirational true story. His dad dies when he's young, his mother um, has a drug abuse problem, and so he's he sort of, he's like, you know, he's bouncing from place to place. He goes to a number of schools growing up. This is Santul Nerker, who covers sports and business for The New York Times. In the last week, he has dutifully rewatched the movie and reread the book that the film is based on. And the story of The Blind Side sort of is that this white family, the Tuies, they see him, they take him in, they give him a place to stay. Michael, do you remember when we first met and we went to that horrible part of town to buy you those dreadful clothes? And I was a little bit scared and you told me not to worry about it because you had my back. Do you remember that? Yes, ma'am. And if anyone tried to get to me, you would have stopped them, right? It's a wealthy white family that takes in uh, a struggling, poor, young black man. And then that young black man uses his athletic talents to get to, to get to college and get to the pros. This team is your family, Michael. You have to protect them from those guys, okay? Are you going to protect the family, Michael? Yes, ma'am. Good boy. And go have some fun. Even though The Blind Side was a commercial success, there were plenty of people who found the movie to be totally cringeworthy. Nearly 15 years later, it may be even more so. The way that that movie reads now uh, to a lot of us is sort of a tidy narrative that ignores a lot of the uh, underlying uh, and troubling racial dynamics of the movie. Um, and the same thing is true of the book, too, the way Michael Orr is portrayed. His story is very much told in terms of the characters around him, most of whom are white. Uh, Michael Orr, you don't hear from him that much. the film in general, you know, it's a football story, but it's just as much a story about this young man becoming part of the Tui family. Like, it's a story about a family. And now there's another chapter to this story with Michael Orr taking the people he's considered his parents to court. I guess I'm just wondering, would you say that this court filing complicates that Hollywood story now? And I think it does because the the story that's told in The Blind Side, and it's told by the Tuies really, is that this is never about them. It was never about the money. I don't think we can say that the Tuies don't care about Michael Orr. It's difficult to look into their motivations. But I think what is clear is that the Tuies very much used The Blind Side and the narrative, you know, the white savior narrative, to, to benefit themselves in many ways. Today on the show, Michael Orr tries to reclaim the narrative. I'm Yasmin Khan in for Mary Harris. You're listening to What Next. Stick around. This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Hey, listeners, whether you love true crime or comedies, celebrity interviews, news, or even motivational speakers, you call the shots on what's in your podcast queue, right? And guess what? Now you can call the shots on your auto insurance, too. Enter the Name Your Price tool from Progressive. The Name Your Price tool puts you in charge of your auto insurance by working just the way it sounds. You tell Progressive how much you want to pay for car insurance, then they'll show you a variety of coverages that fit within your budget, giving you options. Now that's something you'll want to press play on. It's easy to start a quote, and you'll be able to choose the best option for you, fast, it's just one of the many ways you can save with Progressive Insurance. Quote today at Progressive.com to try the Name Your Price tool for yourself. 
and join the over 29 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. A lot of us probably struggle with sleep hygiene, how to fall asleep, stay asleep, and get restful sleep. But did you know that improving your sleep hygiene could help improve your overall health? Health Break, a podcast by UPMC Health Plan, dives into this topic with advice and tips you can use from our expert wellness health coaches. Listen now to find out how you can start improving your sleep at upmchp.us slash healthbreaksleep. That's upmchp.us slash healthbreaksleep. So I kind of want to take a bunch of steps back. You've described it a little bit, but can you just tell us who is Michael Orr? How was he as an athlete? What kind of career did he have? Yeah, so Michael Orr... As an offensive tackle, as a left tackle, his job, and this is where the name of the movie comes in, is to defend the quarterback's blind side. As a player, he was, you know, he was, you know, around 6'4", 6'5", you know, uh, very, very nimble off of his feet for someone of his size. In 2009, he's drafted in the first round. And then he plays in the NFL for eight seasons. He wins the Super Bowl in 2012 with the Ravens. And, you know, he, he, he earns $35 million in his career. So by all accounts, he was a successful professional athlete. Who are the Tuies? How would you describe them? The Tuies, I think it's an interesting story with them. Um, Sean Tuie played basketball for the University of Mississippi. He's drafted into the NBA, but doesn't really, you know, get a shot at playing. So he goes into, you know, into the restaurant business, the restaurant management business. He makes uh, makes a lot of money from owning, selling uh, restaurant franchises. So how did Orr come to meet the Tuies? Sure. So. In the telling of The Blind Side, there was a morning where they were driving and they saw Michael Orr just walking in this neighborhood. And it was a neighborhood where, quote unquote, he shouldn't have been. They didn't understand why this, you know, this big black teenager was walking through in a neighborhood where, you know, they were honest, they, they normally didn't see black people, black teenagers. Um, you know, over time, they got to know him a little bit more. He started staying over. And then eventually um, in 2004, um, they they come to him and say, I think we should adopt you. And just to be clear, do we know that they ever use those words with him? That, that they ever use the term adoption with him? They do say in their book that they were adopted, that they adopted Michael. So this is what they said. But the biggest event for all of us that spring was our adoption of Michael. Actually, this was just a formality, the legal completion of an emotional process that had started long before. In our hearts and minds, Michael was now our third child. In fact, in their 2010 book, the Tuies use a variation on the word adoption more than 30 times. This language, it's really important because just like the rest of America was led to believe, Michael Orr claims he always thought the Tuies had adopted him. But what they'd really done is place him under a conservatorship. Conservatorship, by the way, that word appears zero times in the Tuies book. And where the word adoption evokes images of family, conservatorships are much more contractual. These legal agreements are meant for people who are physically or psychologically unable to handle their own affairs. But as Santul says, that's not Michael Orr. The judge said that Michael Orr had no known physical or psychological disabilities. He had none of the, the signs or the conditions that, uh, that most people who are entering the conservatorship sort of display. Why would a judge allow this to go through? Yeah, that's, that is the, the standing question at this point. Conservatorships are typically not used um, for people in Michael Orr's circumstances. Um, the judge did note in the order that he was dependent on the Tuies, that he wanted to stay in their house, um, that he'd been staying with them for a while. And that was sort of given as a justification as to why he was being put into this conservatorship. Um, but that is not in keeping with what that legal arrangement is usually used for. According to Orr, this conservatorship gave the Tuies tons of control over his life and his money. What were the parameters exactly of the conservatorship, at least according to Orr? Yeah, so it's a good question. The conservatorship was of Michael Orr, the person, which means that the two he's explicitly had power over his, over his decision-making process when it came to uh, medical decisions, they had power of attorney. It was not of the estate, um, which is an important distinction because Michael Orr didn't have any estate. The order also did say that he could not enter into any 
uh, into any contract agreements, anything like that without the TUI's uh, consent first. So, you know, on, on one hand, the order does not say that they have that they have power over his money. But at the same time, Michael Orr is asking the question of, well, did they use did they use this anyway to enter into agreements on my behalf? Did they use my name to benefit themselves without me knowing? Let's fast forward to last week. Orr filed a 14-page petition against the Tuies. What exactly is he claiming in the filing? Me- meaning, like, what exactly is he asking for? So he's asking for a number of things. He's asking for, first and foremost, for the conservatorship to be, dro- conservatorship to be dropped. The Tuies have agreed to that. And he's also asking for a detailed accounting of all the times in which the Tuies have referred to him as his adopted son, all the all the agreements they may have entered into on his behalf. He's essentially asking for like a written record of this conservatorship, which is not that record has not existed for 20, almost 20 years now. So that's what he's claiming. That's what he's asking. And I think it's going to take a long time to get this sorted out in the courts. So we know that the Tuies have said that they will drop the conservatorship. But in general, how have they reacted to this court filing? They have reacted um, publicly with a mix of astonishment, sadness. They've kept saying that, you know, Michael is our son. We will love him. Um, I think, you know, uh, one, two, he said we will love him at 37 the way that we loved him at 18. Um, so they had, that's been their public response. Um, but they've also defended the fact that they had the conservatorship Um, Like we mentioned, they said that it was like becoming part of the family. And through their lawyers, they've also said that essentially that this was kind of forgotten and that they just sort of had let it be. They've also accused Michael Orr of trying to shake them down for $15 million. Um, So that's another important piece of this. That's a fairly sizable accusation from them. A shakedown is pretty strong terminology (laughs) to use for someone you consider to be part of your family. Is there any way to determine who's telling the truth here? You know, I think right now it's just very difficult without the records that I was talking about. You know, um, typically with conservatorships, there's a pretty detailed paper trail when it comes to the transactions that have been entered. Um, You know, Michael Orr came into a lot of money in the NFL. You know, he played for a team that won the Super Bowl. You know, he earned several contracts in the NFL. It's difficult to quantify just how the Tuohys have benefited from for Michael Orr's story, and their role in it. There seems to be some confusion over when Michael Orr realized that he was in a conservatorship, or, or at least that the conservatorship was not what he thought it was. In his memoir from 2011, he writes, quote, they explained to me that conservatorship means pretty much the exact same thing as adoptive parents, end quote. So what Again, just tell me, what did Orr want or think he was getting when he signed that paperwork? Orr has said that he thought it was a necessary part of being adopted. Um, And you're right. In that memoir, he he does say that they were becoming my conservators. So he has known for a long time that the Tuohys were his conservators. What he didn't know, according to his most recent petition, is that he hadn't been adopted. Um, because those are two separate things. Um, Now, some people have said, well, you know, he couldn't have been adopted. He was 18. Um, There are provisions that allow for adult adoption in Tennessee. Um, So that was an option available to the Tuohys. And that was something that Michael wanted um, and that he was under the impression of for all these years, he says. Um, But it just never happened. You know, this may be (laughs) out of your wheelhouse, but there's something that I have just been thinking about as an outsider viewing this story is that if, if this is all, at least the way that this is playing out for Michael Orr, where he's just realizing this year, 2023, that he does not have real legal ties to the Tui family. I'm imagining that all of this is coming out of a place of some pain that he thought he was part of this family and he wasn't. Even beyond the issues of maybe feeling exploited and feeling like he doesn't have control over his life, I- I'm wondering if this has occurred to you of what, or what you think about that. That's certainly what he's saying. And that's what he said in the petition is that this was something that was humiliating for him to find out that he was never part of the family. 
you know, in some ways he said that he felt that he felt that he was let on, that he was, you know, that he was lied to about his relationship with his family. Um, and in many ways, it kind of questions, you know, the real authenticity of the blind side. Uh, here's this wealthy family. They take in the struggling kid. They had no reason to do it. And so for for this detail to come out now, it definitely casts doubt on the authenticity of the original narrative, both captured in the book and in the movie. After the break, how problems with the blind side are coming into sharper focus. Sometimes things in the world of technology are complicated and need careful explaining. Sometimes they just need a little hard truth. I don't think anyone is going to buy a banana with crypto at any point in the foreseeable future. I'm Lizzie O'Leary, the host of Slate's What Next TBD, your clear-eyed guide to technology, power, and the future. Friday and Sunday, wherever you get your podcasts. Hi, you guys. Are you thinking about the same things I am? Like, are you trying to figure out the right way to make fun of Casey DeSantis? Are you similarly concerned about the scourge of bad men from Toronto? Tory Lanez, Tristan Thompson, and Drake, of course, Drake. Are you also worried about the erosion of abortion rights, the restrictions put on gender-affirming care, and what it means if Kyle Richards is actually a lesbian? Great, me too. Now we can do this together. I'm Sachi Cole. You might know me from the podcast Scamfluencers, or my work at BuzzFeed, or This American Life, or Netflix. But I'm in your eardrums right now to tell you that I'm hosting The Waves from Slate Podcasts for the next few weeks. Every episode, I'll be joined by a new guest to unpack the latest terrors in gender, feminism, and the pursuit of an even marginally better world. Tune into The Waves wherever you get your podcasts. I'll be there all August. Hey, friend. Before you hit fast forward through this ad, let me just bend your ear a tick and tell you all about Slate Plus, Slate's membership program. You know that what next is going to be here for you, whether there's big breaking news or whether you just want to hear about a story you might have missed. Basically, we've got you totally covered. And we're here thanks to Slate. If you want to support us, and I know you do, the best way to do that is to join Slate Plus. It'll get you all connected with Slate's award-winning journalism. You'll get ad-free podcasts. You'll get plus-exclusive content on shows like Slow Burn and Political Gab Fest. And you'll never hit a paywall on the Slate site. Every new membership helps ensure we can continue bringing you the biggest stories each week. So go on, hit the pause button, and go to slate.com slash whatnextplus. Again, that's slate.com slash whatnextplus. All right, on with the show. You know, Orr has criticized for years how he's been portrayed in the film. What has he said about that? Well, he said that the film made it out that he didn't know how to play football. Um, and that's something that's I think that's the thing that he has been most upset about. You know, there's a scene in the movie where he's sitting around a dining table with, uh, you know, uh, with the, the son of the family that took him in, Sean Tui Jr., and Sean Tui Jr. is, you know, uh, he's, he's a young kid in this, and he's essentially showing Michael Orr how to move around the football field. Okay, next it's five 100-yard runs to stretch out your legs. We'll just go home and play some video games. Look, everybody at Wingate is expecting you to be a star football player. You don't want to let them down, do you? I don't know. What about and it kind of shows Michael Orr as being unknowledgeable about the game of football, and that is what Michael Orr most did not like about that movie. Uh, is that it showed him out to be somebody who didn't understand his very vocation. Right, and he says that that has followed him for years into his career. Yeah, you know, he said that when he was in the NFL draft and was interviewing with teams, that was something that followed him. That's something that led him to fall in the draft because teams had sort of unspecified suspicions about character issues that he had. Um, he says it's something that affected his NFL contracts and how players viewed him, how teams viewed him. I think the biggest for me is, you know, being portrayed, uh, not being able to read or write. 
when you go into a locker room and your teammates don't think that you can learn a playbook, you know, that weighs heavy. Uh, on some... And again, that is, that's sort of difficult to quantify. You know, he did have a very successful career. Like I said, he had the combination of size, speed, and agility that is so sought after that position. But it is also true that he thinks that this movie is the prevailing image for most Americans of Michael Orr. And I think he is trying to correct that record. Another interesting thing about the film and the book is how little it's really focused on Michael Orr, (laughs) even though it's about him. Um, But it's really, I mean, these stories are really from the vantage point of the Tuies. Um, How would you say that Orr's voice has been missing from these most popular versions of his story? I mean, it's, it's a great question. I mean, to give the book as an example, Michael Lewis didn't really talk to Michael Orr uh, for the book. Now, part of that was that Michael Orr was in high school. He's 16 years old, 17 years old, 18 years old. He was de- dealing with a lot of things independently. Um, but you have Michael Orr's story, a lot of which his early life is like, you know, is not, I don't want to say it's shrouded in mystery, but there aren't many records of it because he sort of bounced from place to place, from home to home. He was staying on a lot of people's couches. That part is very much simplified. His career um, on the football field is simplified. And it is it is very much being defined in terms of what the Tuies thought of him, what the school he went to thought of him. You have to read his books. You have to listen to him talk to get a sense of what he wants the world to think of him. You've said that um, there's a history of Black athletes being sidelined in this way. No? I'm wondering what's changed about that, if anything. Yeah, it's a, you know, it's a good question. I think something what you've seen in recent years um, was a lot of athletes kind of taking their own, their voice into their own hands, Um, not going through media, not going through writers. Um, You know, the movement of a lot of players now to hosting their own podcast is kind of an example of that. You know, uh, I believe it was Draymond Green of the Golden State Warriors who called it new media. And we're taking sort of our perspective into our own into our own hands. And so we're talking about ourselves and we don't need to go through a third party. So it's easy to wonder how how much different the story would be if it was taking place in 2023 than in the early 2000s. So it has been um, two decades since the book, The Blind Side, was written. How would you say that our understanding of racism in sports and written racism has changed in that time? I think it has it has has changed significantly um, in a few ways. Um, One is sort of what I was talking about in terms of how athletes have more control of their own narrative. Um, I I would say depictions is like a very important aspect of this. Black athletes for a long time, you know, have been more likely to be depicted as more, you know, pace and power than smarts. Um, And that's something that the movie really, really typifies you know it doesn't show or as having kind of the acumen to play that position he's just this really really naturally gifted ball of clay that the two is sort of mold in their image um so that's something that certainly changed is that the broader depiction of black athletes um americans overall americans comfort in that has certainly changed to the point where they're they they cringe more at a movie like the blind side salaries too have risen you know um there's more money in sports um Black athletes in many ways have more negotiating power, particularly in college now, um, with NCAA legislation that has allowed college athletes to profit from their their own name, image, and likeness. The system today, while it might not be perfect for athletes, for black athletes, um, it certainly does evolve them more protections than it did um, back in 2004. Okay, so this situation between Orr and the Tuies is a very specific case, but how does Orr's story resonate in a sport where the careers of Black athletes are often controlled by white, wealthy patrons? One thing that's sort of unclear from this is, are there other people in Michael Orr's situation? You know, athletes who, who had preternatural talent and then were helped along the way in the telling of uh, white people that they were helped along the way by white, wealthy families to get to where they are, you know? A very significant part of this is the Tui's connections to the University of Mississippi, their role as boosters, and the fact that Michael Orr ended up at the University of Mississippi. Um, That's a dynamic not just with the University of Mississippi, but with a lot of uh, college football programs uh, around the country. This, I guess you would say, 
uh, amendment or correction to the, to the narrative is something that is resonating more with black athletes and black Americans because they have for a very long time sort of doubted um, the authenticity of this story or the feel good nature of this story. You know, for a long time, many black viewers, uh, many black athletes have seen this as kind of, you know, an infantilization of them. You've written that there was a broad reevaluation of the blind side happening even before these allegations came out. Um, and even when the movie came out, not everyone was very comfortable with it. Like lots of movie critics wrote that it wasn't that great. And at least one I read called it a white liberal fantasy. So people were like clued in to this white savior idea at that time. But how do you think that that the movie is being reevaluated now. Yeah, I think it's what you said. I think a movie like Driving Miss Daisy or The Help, you know, all these movies are sort of being viewed more with suspicion now than they are being viewed as feel good movies. Yeah, do you think Michael Orr's story could be made into a movie today? It might look a little different. <laughs> I mean, there is a reason that it earned more than $300 million. You know, it's one of the highest grossing mov sports movies of all time. So I don't think that suddenly people would not watch that movie now. Um, I think that there's a good case to be made that Michael Ower would have better representation around him that would advocate more on his behalf in terms of how he's portrayed. But, you know, I think that people still really, really like that narrative. It's comforting to their senses. In many ways, it's a story of of sports um, in America. Um, the sort of the view of a black athlete who's helped along by, you know, the white society around him. So I don't want to act like that that part has necessarily changed. Santul, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Santul Nerker covers sports and business for The New York Times. That's the show. If you're a fan of What Next, the best way to support our work is to join Slate Plus. Go to slate.com slash whatnextplus to sign up. What Next is produced by Elena Schwartz, Rob Gunther, Anna Phillips, Paige Osborne, and Madeline Ducharme. We're led by Alicia Montgomery with a little help from Susan Matthews. Ben Richmond is the Senior Director of Podcast Operations here at Slate. And I'm Yasmin Khan, in for Mary Harris. Thanks for listening. Talk to you soon. A lot of us probably struggle with sleep hygiene, how to fall asleep, stay asleep, and get restful sleep. But did you know that improving your sleep hygiene could help improve your overall health? Health Break, a podcast by UPMC Health Plan, dives into this topic with advice and tips you can use from our expert wellness health coaches. Listen now to find out how you can start improving your sleep at upmchp.us slash healthbreaksleep. That's upmchp.us slash healthbreaksleep. Hi, you guys. Are you thinking about the same things I am? Like, are you trying to figure out the right way to make fun of Casey DeSantis? Are you similarly concerned about the scourge of bad men from Toronto? Tory Lanez, Tristan Thompson, and Drake, of course, Drake. Are you also worried about the erosion of abortion rights, the restrictions put on gender affirming care, and what it means if Kyle Richards is actually a lesbian? Great, me too. Now we can do this together. I'm Sachi Cole. You might know me from the podcast Scamfluencers, or my work at BuzzFeed, or This American Life, or Netflix. But I'm in your eardrums right now to tell you that I'm hosting The Waves from Slate Podcasts for the next few weeks. Every episode, I'll be joined by a new guest to unpack the latest terrors in gender, feminism, and the pursuit of an even marginally better world. Tune into The Waves wherever you get your podcasts. I'll be there all August.